I feel very honored uh, to be asked to introduce the speaker for tonight's program. Dr. Michael Dayanan is from Ghana, which also happens to be my home country. He was educated at London University and is a historian and poet. His major interests, of course, are in African history and African literature. He has written numerous uh, poems which have been translated into several languages, apart from the original English language in which he writes in. He worked with the colonial administration in the then Gold Coast and with the newly independent government in Ghana. And we couldn't have found a more qualified person to speak on today's topic because Ghana was the first black African country to gain independence and Dr. Dr. Deanang has first-hand experience with the workings, the transition, and everything that happened during the days between the colonial regime and the newly independent government in Ghana. He worked in the diplomatic service and became, was put in charge of relations between the then uh, newly independent Ghana and other African states. He is at the moment chairman of the Department of African and Afro-American Studies at the State University of New York in Brockport. The topic of his lecture today is cultural linkages in the black pluribus. I feel pleased to introduce Dr. Michael Dan. May I crave your indulgence to take off my jacket? Please. I am very happy indeed and delighted to have the opportunity of making this modest presentation before you today. Ohio, Iowa uh, is very distinguished in uh, history, in agriculture, in technology, and um, it seems rather appropriate that uh, a visitor from far away Africa should have the opportunity of um, sharing views and uh, positions on culture with you. I have come from this part of the world called Ghana. Population ten million. That is a small as uh, New York City, and um, was under the colonial administration from 1844, became independent in 1957, 113 years of colonial rule. And um, you would be surprised, but there are many linkages historically and culturally between various elements in the African continent and uh, areas of culture in this country. And I'm going to try and give some indication of the sectors in which the continents can meet in this way. So I'll speak mainly about Africa but occasionally, as a Ghanaian, I will make references which involves our culture. I believe that in all discussions about Africa and her peoples, those who are still on the continent of Africa, and her many children in the diaspora, Afro-American, Afro-Caribbean, afro Brazilian, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Haitian, and so on, it is essential that the vastness of Africa's size should be borne in mind. Africa's landmass is three times the area of the United States. It is so huge indeed that the whole of the state of Ireland 
could be neatly swallowed by one of its lakes alone. But Africa's size is not its only distinctive character. Africa has the tallest men and the shortest men in the world. It is a land of great contrasts, historically, geographically, ethnologically. As recent archaeological discoveries have shown, the earliest forms of biological life existed in Africa 20 million years ago. Dr. L.S.B. Lickey and his excavations have highlighted, highlighted the presence of pre zinjathropos or Homo habiles, known to have dwelt in Africa some 1.7 million years ago. The conclusions that one might draw from this include the fact that whether you are yellow, brown, red, or gold, or what have you, your origin is the continent Africa. I have no time to go into the reasons why the shades of color have become what they are. But as I go on with the lecture, various features of the lecture will indicate why. We are therefore getting to know and understand the continent and its peoples better by a careful study of his history and culture. In spite of all this, the world, particularly the Western world, has shown no great disposition to appreciate the African position in the world. Judgment values about Africa are still largely based on Western standards that bear no relation whatever to Africa's environmental situation and circumstances. Oral history of the continent, which until recently largely constituted the main storehouse of knowledge about Africa, has been regarded as a very fragile and inadequate vehicle of communication in the eyes of the modern world. It was thus, thus left to the overzealous missionaries and commercial travelers, and slave traders, and colonial administrators to paint their own picture of Africa to the world. Truly, has history been defined by an acknowledged authority, and I quote, as the record of the life of societies and of the material conditions which have helped or hindered their development, end of quote. There are, of course, positive as well as negative methods which can be adopted to prevent natural growth in any given environment. In the case of Africa, the negative cause was the purposive distortion of the cultural values of its peoples, which gradually led to a total rejection of its existence. It has been pointed out, for example, that Africans of the diaspora suffered most from this treatment, having been forcibly uprooted from their cultural foundations, depressed and humiliated by the degrading conditions of slavery, particularly in North America, they lost their sense of dignity and pride in themselves. Some of the early missionaries in Africa, before they had time to study African life and culture, were instrumental in creating the image of the benighted, quote, African, and gave currency to such notions on fundraising occasions by using specially composed missionary hymns, as in the following example, and I quote, the heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. 
quotation. The heathen in his blindness bows down to wood and stone. And that's the description of the missionary who, as a Catholic, revered the cross built of wood. Then it goes on, and can we whose souls are lighted with wisdom from on high, can we to men benighted the lamp of life deny? As Christians, we have a special relationship to God because we think he's white and he understands us. But those black people in the backwoods of Africa have not the faintest idea about God. Let us talk to them because we are obligated by our special relationship with God to bring knowledge of him to men whose souls are benighted. It is interesting when you read literature of the 17th century, and one of the first well-known poets of this country from the black dimension was a young girl who was picked up on the banks of the river in West Africa and was brought to Massachusetts and trained so well, thank God, that very soon she began to give evidence of her literary prowess by writing poetry. First black woman who did that. And she, even then, involving herself in the images of the period, began to write about how lucky she was that she was lifted out of the darkness of her environment in Africa and brought into new light in the new world. In the case of the merchant adventurer, his main concern seemed to have been to seek the sensational and bizarre aspects of foreign life as this served to heighten the effect of his travels abroad by impressing his stay-at-home compatriots with the magnitude of his courage. That he could go like H.M. Stanley and look for the source of the Congo was quite a feat. And then he comes back and says, oh, those backward people, they are cannibals. They, they live in utter darkness. And that is sensationalized in the press. And if you read the literature of the period again, it is rife with this kind of distortion and depressive accounts about the black image in the African continent, which was therefore dark. And I've always told my history students that Africa always existed. It was dark in the minds of people whose ignorance did not reveal Africa to them. So you have that feature of the merchant and the missionary conspiring to distort the image of the black world in that way. Between the errant missionary, the greedy trader, and the colonial ruler, it is difficult to determine who did the most damage to the image of the black man. Pursuing radically different interests with totally different objectives, somehow they managed together to promote the deformation of the culture of the African with a remarkable degree of success. The black slave was eager to break away from his bondage. But the missionary was also eager to bring the lamp of life to the benighted men and women whose color happened to be black. You see the easy relationship between blackness and benightedness. The slave trader with distorted logic and a rare sense of inhumanity claimed that the black man was happier in slavery than in freedom within his own environment. And we have been, even been told in Africa that we promoted the slave trade because we sold our own people into slavery. And I'd like questions on that aspect because I have answers to that specific dimension of the slave trade about which I know so much. As for the colonialist, he was merely following the tradition of Roman imperialism. And again, I quote, the fundamental principle of Roman colonialism, which was the background of classical colonialism from which Western imperialism, imperialism developed. And there, this is a famous expression from Roman history. Superbus de Bellare, artisque imponere, 
the Roman saw himself as the arbiter of civilization. And, and in fact, in Roman history and in Greek history, anyone who could not speak Latin or Greek was considered a barbari, the barbari, the backward people who did not speak the language of the civilized. And you remember from your, your history that after 400 years of occupation of the island of Britain, when the Romans were leaving the island eventually, they turned back and said, those backward primitive people on the island, what are they going to do when we are gone? They are so backward that they have wives in common and they paint their faces in wood. Now you notice this, that if the Romans had not left Britain, it would have remained a colonial territory and all the di discoveries that took place in science and philosophy and art would not have taken place. As the philosopher said, the mind only thrives in freedom. But see what happened. To the Romans of that day, the B British were barbaric. To us, we know better. The Romans did not have our hindsight. So in these circumstances, and in this variety of ways, external forces in suppressing the essential truths about Africa and Africans gained the order of the day. Somehow, these same forces didn't fail to eulogize the greatness and splendor of the civilizations of the pharaohs on the banks of the Nile River. They did this in order to emphasize their contempt for the history of the black peoples by pointing out effectively that though the pharaonic civilizations developed in Africa, the art and culture of the Egyptians belonged to the genius of the white race. And you know from history that the fundamental principles of mathematics developed around the banks of the Nile. And in the University of Alexandria, all your philosophies, philosophers of Greece went to learn philosophy. The concept of Euclid was developed, developed around the Nile from the mathematicians of that area. Whether they are black or not is not the question at the moment. It's irrelevant. Because indeed, with the mixture of the races that has taken place through the migrations that occurred in the world, it is very difficult to say indeed, uh, you have to be a Hitler to do it, that someone belongs to a specific kind of race. <coughs> you see how black I am standing here? My great-grandfather was one of the Portuguese traders who went to Africa before Columbus discovered this continent. Just took an African woman, and mated, and they produced children of whom I'm a descendant. So it is very difficult to say what you are. And what you are is not determined by the color of your skin, but by the quality of your mind. And what that quality of the mind will be is not dictated by the race to which you belong, but the environment from which you come. Much was made of the geographical proximity of Egypt to the Mediterranean states of the European race. And very little was said of the Islamic domination of countries like Spain and Portugal during a large part of the Middle Ages. With characteristic ethnocentrism, it was assumed that the black man was incapable of attaining such a high degree of cultural excellence and development. The late W.E.B. Du Bois was known to have reacted very sharply to this betrayal of the truth by pointing out that the ancient Greeks who knew Egypt better considered Egypt as a part of Africa, both in geographic location and in culture. That's a quotation from Du Bois. As long as misconceptions about the black man prevailed, one heard little or nothing about the intellectual flowering in Timbuktu during the Middle Ages, or about the vigor and wealth of the ancient empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, or 
about the great entrepot of trade in the city of Jenny in the Western Sudan, some 1,300 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. Timbuktu, for many years, had a flourishing trade with many parts of the then known world, exchanging ivory, cola nuts, and gold with the new commodities of the Western world. In both Timbuktu and Jenny, two universities had produced hundreds of teachers, among whom were individuals distinguished, distinguished for their record in medicine and excellence in surgery. I have the references for this, for scholars who are interested. Recent excavations of renowned archaeologists in Kenya and the energetic scholarship of modern historians in Africa are beginning to throw new light on Africa's past greatness and glory. Nok culture, for example, and Benin bronze from Nigeria, now happily authenticated as pre-European by scientific dating processes, accounts of ancient trade relations between India, Malaysia, China, with the peoples of East Africa, which the Greeks knew as Azania, the ruins of Zimbabwe in Central Africa, tell a long tale of cultural growth and maturity of remarkable excellence. It was through the interchange between Africa and the Orient that China were and agricultural products such as rice, sweet potatoes, bananas became household words in Africa before they got transported in the wake of the slave trade to the new world. If, therefore, in addition to a serious study of Africa's past, we also take a careful look at some of the habits and mode of living of the black man in Africa today, we shall discover a rich tradition of customs, political organization, and philosophy comparable to the highest and best forms of culture and philosophy anywhere else in the world. Such a study is particularly relevant in our time, not merely as a basis for comparison with other cultural forms, because African culture deserves to be understood and appreciated in its own right. Doing so, however, will enable us to remove the external norm by which it's been judged in the past and make it possible to eliminate centuries of ignorance and prejudice which informed and clouded judgment over African values. For the black peoples of the diaspora, there is the need to appreciate the greatness of their heritage and cultural roots. Witness Alex Haley and Ruth today. As the black poet from Martinique, Amy Césaire, has said, thinking about his Caribbean situation, and I quote, Black Africa is a mother of our West Indian civilization, and it is she who will regenerate our energy and hope. Therefore, at the risk of oversimplification, it should be stated that every human grouping has its own way of life, a way of dealing with the challenges confronting it that reflects its environmental conditions. For example, let me refer to one mannerism that first struck me in this country, which was the use of the term hi as a form of salutation and greeting in this country. In my country of Ghana, hi is the imperative expression for driving away sheep and goats from our compound. Thus, what in the United States serves as a means of recognition and welcome appears as a form of insult and rejection in Ghana. 
We therefore need to be very careful, even about the way we express ourselves in foreign situations. Writing about these differences in behavior, some time ago, I had occasion to express some concern mm -hmm. about certain forms of student behavior in Britain that struck me as odd and embarrassing. I noticed that when speaking to lecturers, which in the African sense would be their superiors, students often had their hands buried in their pockets. In my country, if you speak to your superior, you're not allowed to look at him straight in the face. You bend down and, so that you can hear what he's talking to you. So for me, doing this to a lecturer who was a student, who was a superior of the student, was wrong in manners. But my immediate reaction was shock and embarrassment because it was strange to me. Until my first experience of severe wintry conditions in Britain <laughs> gave me new dimensions of courtesy which changed my opinion about the behavior of the British student. <laughs> Truly, man's ways of living are conditioned by various factors, environmental, emotional, and includes forces such as climate, beliefs, and our general outlook upon life. Take the ordinary example of the appreciation of beauty. I've always said I don't understand why when white people meet to organize competitions for beauty, black people get themselves involved. Because their standards of beauty are different. I've said this many times in my discussions in, on culture. If you, you in this country, in the Western world, like your beautiful ladies to be slim like the pencil line. For us, a beautiful lady is one who is shaped like an egg. <laughs> round with the wrinkles <laughs> around the neck, topped over by an egg-shaped head again. And she walks with a rather lax and steady gait. Because we know that royalty do not hurry. And beauty is related to royalty. And women are our royalty in our society. This is the special place of honor and respect we accord them. So they walk with humble gay legs. And, and you must do this. And then again, I was offended. I was struck. What's wrong with these people? What are they hurrying after? Until I knew about two dimensions, the importance of keeping time. <laughs> the other dimension is the need to generate heat in the cold weather. So you cannot afford to amble along as leisurely as we do. So the differences are occasioned and patterned by the environmental differences. It is therefore important to keep these diversities in mind when we pass value judgments about concentrations of people outside our own area of existence. Now, let me examine a few examples with you of group behavior in Ghana as illustrating the nature and scope of the cultural values of the African people. We have something called an outdooring ceremony for children. On the eighth day of the birth of a child, an outdooring or naming ceremony is performed. By the eighth day, the elders of our community know that the child's chances of survival are reasonably good and assured. The eighth day also repeats the day of the week on which the child was born. And that day provides the child with its first name. If the child was a girl, she would be, she would be given the female equivalent of the name day. So in most parts of Ghana, and in some parts of Togo, Dahomey, the Ivory Coast, Sierra Leone, and other parts of West Africa. First names occur as follows. 
Monday, if it's a male child, it's called Kwajo. If it's a female child, she's called Adwa. My wife is born on Monday, we call her Adwa. That's her first name. Tuesday is Kwabena. If it's a woman, it's Abena. Wednesday is Kwaku. If the girl is a Kua. Thursday is Yao. Oh, and incidentally, I discovered from re reading recently about subversion in China. Of all places, that one of the four people indicted with subversion has a name called Yao Wen Yuan. Yao, in my country, is spelled like this Y A O or Y A W. In China, it's spelled the same Y A O. I'm not deriving any cultural linkages with China. It's too remote, but it is of great interest to witness the emergence of that name so far away from Africa. And if it's a child born on Friday, it is Kofi, and the female name is Efua. Saturday, which is what I am, is Kwame. And Saturday is preeminent. See, it has all the graces. God himself is God. It's called Kwame. And it, it is significant, and it, 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 it gives you a sense of courage and, and creativity. Which you are not responsible for. And as, 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 as you take your star from the moon, month, whether you are Pisces or Aries or Libra, ours is identified by the day of the week. Because the graces are believed to be in the day, very near, very close. And Sunday is Kosi, with its feminine gender, Akosia or Esi, which is very popular in most parts of the Western world. The naming ceremony was simple, but impressive, because it was full of cultural significance. Very early at dawn, before sunrise, friends and relatives of the parents were invited to the home of the newborn child. There, an elder of the family took the naked child in his arms, touched the earth with him three times, and returned him to his arms. Contact with the earth was necessary because the earth mother, Asasiya, is believed among the Akan people to be the source and origin of life and of social stability. So you identify the child very early with its physical origins, Mother Earth. The child must therefore secure early acquaintance with the earth and later learn to establish his physical and cultural equipoise in relation to it. The earth has always been very important in history. You remember the well-known case of Brutus and his cousin going to consult the oracle at Delphi. And when they had finished, the oracle said, the one of you who first kisses his mother on her arrival in Rome will be the ruler of the Roman Empire. Brutus, who had always been known to be foolish and stupid, and give him that name Brutus for. Heard about it and got an idea. He didn't wait to get back to Rome to kiss his mother. As soon as they left the room of the oracle, he pretended to fall and kiss the ground. That is his mother. So Brutus had preeminence over his cousin. You don't even hear his cousin's name in Roman history. But Brutus, for what he was worth, has survived through history. <laughs> because he was clever about knowledge concerning the earth. Now, the ceremony continues, and the elder dips his forefinger into a bowl of liquor. <laughs> West Africans became familiar with rum and gin through the exchange of gold and spices and ivory with the early European traders. They came to pick up gold, and they brought us rum to drink and booze. So the elder touches the liquor with his forefinger and says to the child in his arms, Kofi or Ya, this is rum. Taste and see. When you taste it, say it is rum, not water. He then repeats the process with water, dips his forefinger in water and touches Kofi or Ya's lips with it and says, Ya, Kofi, this is water. When you taste it, Say it is water, not rum. The greatest virtue in our tribe 
is respect for truth and honesty. You must not forget this among us. So he hands his oration to the child. The elder now hands the baby to his mother, exhorting her fervently to bring him up properly in accordance and in conformity with the standards of the tribal community. Finally, another elder gets up and he's requested to pour libation to round off the ceremony. I will talk about pouring libation later. It's very interesting and sensitive. Before departing, the invited guests and relatives present the child with gifts. These gifts are usually monetary. The mother keeps the amount received as the basis of a savings fund for the child. Traditionally, she used this to buy a chicken or a goat which was reared on behalf of the baby until he was old enough to look after it himself. Usually, enough money was raised in this way to buy a piece of land or other property for the new member of the community. We didn't have insurance companies, but we knew how to deal with it. And if you go out looking for uh, Omaha Mutual of Omaha in Accra, you're kidding yourself, it's not there. But the absence of that institution does not indicate the absence of the care for the future. They have all kinds of ways of dealing with it. And it is when you look for the specifics you are aware of and don't find them in the strange environment that you begin to make your judgment on how primitive people can be. Now there is also a very famous ceremony associated with the coming of age process. Coming of age in Africa is marked by other forms of ritual, generally referred to as puberty or initiation rites. These were organized by the elders of the community for young men and women between the ages of 14 and 19. In the past, initiation ceremonies were regarded with interest as a necessary part of the process of acceptance into the tribal group. Initiation was thus designed to ensure that the young men and women had passed the test of manliness, of womanliness, and of courage, ready to take up their place in society, and if need be, their bows and arrows in defense of that society. Women were integrated into the society of elderly women in the neighborhood, and they had to visibly prove their chastity to the elders of the community before they can be supported in any attempt to secure marriage. And very sensitive ritual was established for identifying the girl who had not honored her position in the community in that way. And Jomo Kenyatta, first president of Kenya, East Africa, has immortalized this African ritual in his now famous book, Facing Mount Kenya which is of considerable interest to anthropologists. Then we have funeral rites from birth to marriage to burial. So the life cycle is complete. When a member of the tribal group died, elaborate funeral customs were observed in connection with the disposal of his remains. The events were terminated only after proper arrangements had been made for the care and maintenance of his domestic responsibilities in total, and purification ceremonies for the surviving members of his entire family were conducted. But when a chief dies, it's a very elaborate and complicated ritual. There's only time to indicate some of the main essentials of that event. Among the Akans of my country, the belief is still prevalent that the king is the embodiment of the soul of his people, and as such, he never dies. If you have the ritual in the um, constitutions where uh, they respect a king, you have a monarchy, you have the well-known expression, the king is dead, long live the king. 
We don't even consider the possibility of death without him. They never die because they are the soul of the community. And they don't therefore talk about their king being dead. He merely goes to his village. His village is the other world about which we know so much and about which the missionaries knew nothing. They talked to us about God whom we should serve in this world in the hope of promise and gain in the other world. So in slavery, they doped us with the opium of Christianity so we would accept our condition of servitude without demur, coolly and quietly, because we would have heaven in the life thereafter. Our awareness of heaven is here and now. There is continuity between the present and the future by a carefully arranged system of cultural awareness. In Africa, we know that the only tragedy which is calamitous is the total eradication of the kingly presence because our culture is woven around the institution of leadership. And what we say is this, and I repeat this in the original language of my community. Literally, it means a violent storm has uprooted a mighty tree today. Only that act of nature can overturn the position of our king. And so that's the extent we can go. We do not think of him as dead. Because the tree, when it falls, has self generation. We know that in our forest knowledge. Tree falls down, it grows up again. And in my country, the palm nut is very rarely planted. You pull it down, and in the next five years, there's a little shoot coming up. So there is that continuity. In Africa, and this is about the dance ritual in Africa, almost every circumstance of life in the community is celebrated or marked by dancing, drumming, and singing. Indeed, through dancing, Africans speak with their bodies. Their arms and eyes speak with extraordinary and vivid eloquence, understood only by those trained in the special art of the drum language. To watch the grace and elegance of the women of Senegal or Ashanti in dance, or the billowing dance rhythms of the Yoruba, or the virile virtuosity of the Watusi in their spear dance, and the vigorous Agbaja dance of the Ewe people, in which the human frame gyrates and trembles with the liquidity of molten steel, is to carry away with one a most memorable impression. It is this form of body control and animation in dance rhythms that the black man has perpetuated in the dance halls of the new world. The black man, having lost the spoken word in the transatlantic slave trade, retained the foundations of his linguistic behavior. His basic psyche in the factories and plantations of North America and South America was not distorted by deprivation and distance from the roots of the continent. So the black men brought with them to the new world their essential Af Africanness in rhythm and emotion of the dances which have become established today as the jazz in Af America, the samba in Brazil, the rumba in Cuba, and the tango in Argentina. And what about music? Music based predominantly on the folk tales of the people and used particularly for religious and ceremonial and festal occasions in Africa has acquired a special significance by permeating the entire life of the African people. So the fisherman has his rowing song. The market woman and street vendor her enticing, tuneful melody. I sang one to the Brunners, I think, sometime. 
today. And the farmer, his rustic chant, over the years, the African has proved to be a past master in improvisation in music. Originally, not scoring his music by means of set schematic forms and notation, the African has nevertheless provided the world with some of the most unforgettable song hits in recorded history. Rhythm is a distinctive feature of such music, which invariably rests on drumming to give it its most evocative effect. And let me pass on quickly to art. As is generally known, African art was for many years in the past dismissed, even condemned, as primitive and crude, until Pablo Picasso and others of his school turned the eyes of the Western world to a form of art in Africa noted for its vitality and vigor. The bronze sculptures of Benin and Ife in West Africa, produced by the lost wax process, are now priceless art features in the major museums of the world. Now I'd like to talk a little about ancestor worship. Belief in a life hereafter is practically universal in Africa. Where men repudiate such a belief, they tend to be reduced to the level of brutes. But throughout the world, there are various degrees of credibility, depending on the extent and depth of reverence for the divine. Virgil, in his sixth Aeneid, gives us a picture of the ancient Romans' ideas concerning existence after death. We know that Virgil and the Romans of his time drew largely from Greek sources for the picture they held of man's existence after death. Subsequently, Dante in his Inferno employed these same ideas to paint a vivid, horrific image of man's fate in the other world. To the African, however, life after death is not legendary. It's not recorded in books. It's not an imaginary existence. It is a real, active, throbbing arena which harbors the communal consciousness. There is a pot positive and intimate continuity, even solidarity with the other world. When the Akan man talks of going to Asamanade, the land of the fleeting spirits, he can visualize the kind of corporeal transformation with which he's dealing. For him, his ancestors exist, even as spirits. Thus, he must maintain his obligations of loyalty, respect, remembrance, and service towards them. As in Roman times, the correct observance and fulfillment of these obligations are believed to be noted and rewarded by the blessings and approval of the ancestors. Practical expression of these beliefs is seen, for example, in the making of Africans of provision for the spectral existence of their ancestors. This is given concrete effect by leaving vessels of food and water on their tombs and filling their coffins with some of the most prized possessions of their burial. And in every African burial, the fourth, the lid of the coffin is put in position. The family take care that they have a little piece of coin stuck in the belt around the waist to help him to pay his obligations in the other world. It seems legendary, it seems visual, but remember that again, Virgil refers to this in describing uh, Charon ferrying people across the Stygian waves. If, if you didn't have the money to pay for the ferry, you were stuck behind it. So, you see, human nature is essentially the same. We have all developed from one state of mind until the complexities of technology took us away from that state of mind. This practice 
of maintaining the bond of union between the seen and the unseen portions of life, despite the shock that the calamity of death administers, is one of the fundamental characteristics of African life. Only those who fail to appreciate the importance of these values to the African describe them as ancestor worship. In Ghana and in other parts of Africa, this sense of continuity between the living and the dead is further expressed by the ritual of pouring libation. That is, an invocation of the past members of the community requesting their participation or intervention in the affairs of the living. To pour libation an elderly member of the family on a specific occasion, such as travel to a distant land, or choosing a wife, or naming a newborn child, or welcoming a distinguished guest, pours liquor on the ground with his feet unshod, his cloth drawn downwards to the level of his breast, calls upon the principal members of the family who are deceased, and invites them to take notice of the occasion and make it propitious. Such invocation often ends with the curse of disaster and misfortune upon the head of any one among the living who does not wish the occasion or subject to go well. And we had a very interesting example of, of the application of this culture recently. And by recently, I mean way back in 1961. When the Queen of Britain first decided to visit our country after our independence. And within the program, we made provision for the pouring of libation to the queen. All the churches in Ghana stood up in arms against this. How can you perform a pagan ceremony when the queen of England, head of the Christian church in Britain, is visiting your land? It will not be done. And we said, you know, you are denying her a very propitious occasion. If we don't pour libation for her, and if any evil comes to her, you are responsible. <laughs> so determined to ensure the security and safety of their queen in a foreign land, they succumbed. <laughs> and we poured libation to the queen, and her visit ended well and propitiously. So that's why you never heard about this happening. <laughs> also believe that God, and the name they give to God is this, the great creator who satisfies all your needs, sent you to the world for a specific purpose, that being human, you have normal limitations. That's not predestination. It's reality, which set bounds to your cause of action. And we have a proverb which says in the Ghanaian language, as a man, you can only do your fill. You cannot do everything. You, you cannot wish to be president forever. You must know when to stop. If you go on, you become Nixon. And then you, have, you are in trouble. Now, you must learn to appreciate the reality in the forces that are at work in your environment. So. They are aware of this. It's, it's a philosophy which is very sensitive and delicate. Your end must come so as to enable you to take your rest in another world. From that world, you are allowed to enjoy the spectacle of life among the living. If Epictetus, the Greek Roman philosopher, had lived today, he, I am sure, would have been very much at home within the African environment. Perhaps it is now necessary to consider, I've talked so long about Africa, but let us consider the claim that the cultural roots of all dark peoples, as distinct from the red and yellow shade, may be found in Africa. The one, of course, and direct obvious point that can be made here is that it is only among concentrations of black peoples throughout the world that one finds manifestations of group behavior, such as the voodoo, the jazz, the spirituals, and so, in quotes. Those who know and understand the music, 
dance forms, and rhythm of Africa will find no difficulty in tracing these manifestations to their source in Africa. Thus, through religion, art, dance, and music, the genius of the black man triumphed over the doom of slavery in the New World. These were the vehicles of self-expression which helped to sustain the soul of the black man and gave it that spiritual resilience and unparalleled powers of endurance that characterized his life in adver adversity. Music, dance, religion are so pervasive of life that it was impossible to suppress them in any way. So you notice that you sitting there, you and you are like cousins in my country. You have our image, but I cannot talk to you because the language link was broken. But if I pick the drum now and jazz here, your reaction to this is much more manifest than anyone else will do. It's the obvious linkage which exists through the sensitive linkages of the soul in spite of history. Before the early part of this century, African music also was dis dismissed and degraded as pieces of cacophonous noises. Those are descriptions from studies that were made from the Western world. There was, however, no scientific basis for that description because there was no serious study of such music. Today, African music and its manifestations in the new world, whether as jazz or spiritual or gospel singing, are widely acclaimed as revealing new dimensions of musical culture. This artistic apocalypse has become total and fundamental in our generation. In religion, it is not clear from, is it not clear from the increasing tendency to employ drumming, hand clamping, and dancing as forms of ritual in church worship, that the African way of acknowledging the omnipotence and omnipresence of God, Onyankopong, has already invaded the Christian churches in the New World. But more positive evidence of survival have pre exist in other forms. You know about um, ritual and practices that have been preserved in their purest form in the cult houses among the inhabitants of Bahia in Brazil. Among the names given to these cults is Shango. As students of Yoruba culture are aware, Shango was the traditional god of the Yorubas. The symbol of reverence of that god was the ram, believed to be a survival from ancient Egyptian religious rites. I have the references here for any scholars who are interested. Here, one finds the links in the cultural chain standing out clearly from Egypt through West Africa to Brazil. Even language forms that have survived centuries of acculturation in the New World include the use of certain African names. In the Caribbean, such names as Kofi, Essie, and Kojo are still remembered and in use. As we have already pointed out, African names are given to commemorate or ce celebrate specific occasions and situations. They often give some indication of the time and circumstances of birth, or the physical appearance, temperament, and mental qualities of a member of the family whom it is desired to commemorate. Examples are these. Agona is a region in Ghana. It is the name, second name given to various children. Anika means she is beautiful. It's a name adopted and used in Liberia today. Sanko is a tribal area in Sierra Leone, West Africa. It is adopted as a name. Zola, Z-O-L-A, is a name, a 
It's a term used in Zaire, the Congo, and it means love. There are many people called Zola in the world. Baba Tunde is a particularly felicitous Nigerian name. Baba Tunde, the child that is born uh, as a restoration of the father's image, is memorialized in that name, Baba Tunde. And Tobam in Ghana is given to the child that is born at, on the death of the father. So uh, Antubam means the child missed the tender care of parents. And it's usually given to children born during or after the death or one of one or other members of the family. In the year 1759, this is coming nearer home now. In the year 1759, there was born on an island near Bedford in Massachusetts to an African-born former slave, a child who was named Paul Coffey. Paul was the first name. Coffey, you find that in Afro-American history. Paul Coffey. He grew up to become a most remarkable black man, even in those hostile times of slavery. He refused to pay his personal tax in the state of Massachusetts under the inspiration of the anti-colonial slogan, no taxation without representation. Paul Coffey said he was not represented in the legislature of Massachusetts, so he would not pay his tax, following the Boston Tea Party experience. He was, of course, threatened with a jail term by the state tax collector. So Paul Coffey paid to avoid imprisonment, but promptly presented a round robin petition with the support of many blacks in Massachusetts to the state legislator, legislature, protesting the tax on the grounds that, and I quote, they had no voice or influence in the election of those who taxed us. This led to the enactment granting black folk in Massachusetts all privileges in the state. I have the reference here for scholars who are interested. But Paul Coffey was thus among the earliest blacks to develop a civil rights consciousness in this country. Although this is an interesting historical account, I've not referred it, I've not referred to it here to invite attention to his civil rights consciousness. I've done that to invite attention to the second name Coffee. K C U F S E, which, as you can well recognize, is a corruption of K O F I, Kofi, which is a child born in Ghana, male child born on Friday. So they retain these linkages. 1800, 18th century, Paul Kofi. This is obviously a corruption of the African name Kofi, which, as you may recall, is the first name of a Ghanaian male, male child born on Friday, a very significant example of cultural survival. Hmm. Those of you who are familiar with the history of Africa will be aware that the struggle for independence originated in the Gold Coast. And the Gold Coast which became Ghana was therefore the first colonial territory south of the Sahara to have sovereign independence. It is significant that one of the Gold Coast descendants in this new world struck the first blow for the civil rights campaign way back in the 18th century when people were not even prepared to talk about it then. A further positive an incontrovertible sign of black survival in the new world is the retention of the African features of blackness in skin color and in the distinctive physical features of rounded lips, full nose, and heavy dark woolly hair. This retention is of considerable racial interest in view of the extensive miscegenation 
that has occurred over many centuries in a dominant white society. Yeah.